Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be going through topic 4 of your AQA GCSE Biology. So Laura's going to take you through everything clearly, everything slowly, then after you've watched each section you can go do three questions, three flashcards over on the website. Plants carry out photosynthesis using light energy absorbed from chloroplasts in the plant cells. Carbon dioxide that they take in from the atmosphere as it diffuses through the stomata into leaves. Water that is absorbed by osmosis from the soil by root hair cells. And that goes through the process of photosynthesis to produce oxygen, which is released into the atmosphere as it diffuses out of the leaves via the stomata. And glucose, which is then transported by the phloem to all cells to be used by the plant. Photosynthesis is the chemical reaction that takes place in plant cells that uses light energy, carbon dioxide and water to make sugars. The simple equation is carbon dioxide plus water, light energy over the arrow, oxygen plus glucose, which symbol is C6H12O6. It's an endothermic reaction because it takes in light energy. We need to know how plants use the glucose they produce from photosynthesis. A lot of it is used up in respiration to release energy for processes in the cells. Some can either be converted to starch or used to produce lipids for storage. Some is used to produce cellulose in the cell walls. Some is combined with nitrates from the soil to produce amino acids. These can then be used to make proteins through protein synthesis. We need to know the factors that can affect the rate of photosynthesis. As you increase light intensity, it increases the rate of photosynthesis. As you increase the carbon dioxide concentration, it increases the rate of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is an enzyme controlled reaction. So increasing the temperature increases the rate of photosynthesis up until the optimum and then it decreases if it increases past that optimum temperature. The amount of chlorophyll in a leaf or in chloroplasts in plant cells, if there's more chlorophyll, then more light energy can be absorbed, so the rate of photosynthesis can be increased. We need to be able to explain what's going on in rate of photosynthesis graphs with the different factors. So for light intensity and carbon dioxide, the graph looks the same, there's an increase and then a flat line. On the increase or the slope of the graph at A, whatever is on the x-axis, light intensity or carbon dioxide, is the limiting factor, because as it increases, the rate increases. When we get to the flat line at B, another factor is limiting the rate of photosynthesis, not what's on the x-axis. So for example, it could be temperature. The rate of photosynthesis reaction with temperature on the x-axis looks very similar and can be explained in the same way as any enzyme rate of reaction graph. Initially, there is a low increase in the rate of photosynthesis when temperatures are low because there is less kinetic energy of the particles. Then we get to the peak, which is the optimum temperature and the fastest rate of photosynthesis. And then the slope of the graph goes down because higher than the optimum temperature, the rate decreases due to enzymes that control photosynthesis denaturing. These factors could be changed in a lab when doing the photosynthesis practical, or you could need to interpret how these factors might affect plants growing outside. When measuring the rate of photosynthesis in the lab, we can change various independent variables based around the factors that can affect the rate of photosynthesis. We can change the light intensity, by moving a light or a lamp closer or further away from our plant. We should use a heat shield in order to make sure that only light intensity is being measured and not temperature. Different colours of light can affect the rate of photosynthesis as more red and more blue light are absorbed and green light is reflected by chloroplasts. So we can use different colour LED bulbs or coloured filters in front of a white bulb. We could use a water bath at different temperatures to create different temperature conditions for our plant. Or we could change the carbon dioxide concentration by using different masses of bicarbonate of soda or sodium hydrogen carbonate 
which we would dissolve in the water the plant is in. This test tube we see come up this test tube and measure that in a certain amount of time to be able to calculate rate. You could also use a gas syringe or a measuring cylinder to collect and measure the volume of oxygen produced in a set amount of time. Let's look at an example method with light intensity being the independent variable. The control variables will need to be anything other than light intensity that could affect the rate of photosynthesis. So we need to keep the temperature the same, the volume of water the pondweed is in the same, the carbon dioxide concentration, so the mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate used the same, and the colour of light should be the same. The type of pondweed used or the same pondweed should also be kept the same. I placed a heat shield, which is just a beaker of water in between the lamp and the pondweed, so that the heat energy from the lamp is absorbed into that water and increases the temperature of that water, but the light energy passes through to our plant. This means that only light intensity is the factor that's changing and the temperature should not change with our pondweed. You could also use an LED bulb, which does not produce as much heat. My independent variable then is my distance from the lamp. As we move the bulb closer to our pondweed, the light intensity will increase. So we start far away, we measure the amount of bubbles produced in a set amount of time, then we move the bulb closer, we can use a ruler to measure the distance, leave the pondweed to settle for a small amount of time, at least five or 10 minutes, so that the rate of photosynthesis has time to change, if it's going to change, then you measure the number of bubbles in a minute or however long time you're going to do again. And then again, you repeat by moving the lamp closer again, letting it settle, and then measuring the number of bubbles in a set time again. Just be clear in the exam what you are measuring, how you're going to measure it, especially having to remember to measure it in a set amount of time if you're going to calculate rate. Make sure you are clear about what the independent variable is, what are you changing in the experiment, and making sure that you understand that all the other control variables should be kept the same if they're going to affect the rate of photosynthesis. We need to be able to demonstrate the inverse square law. As the distance from a lamp increases, the light intensity decreases as the photons in the light have to spread out over a larger area. So there is less light energy overall hitting the plant. In the practical, we are moving the distance of the lamp. So we can show that light intensity is directly proportional to one divided by the distance squared or the inverse square of the distance. So in the practical, we are not changing the light intensity directly, we are moving the distance of the lamp, but we can show how the link between the distance of the lamp and light intensity is a linear relationship. So if we plot the line of one over the distance of the lamp squared against the rate of photosynthesis, you can see that it's a straight line that goes through the origin, which shows it is directly proportional. The factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis can interact with each other, and to optimise plant growth, a balance must be found. Temperature and carbon dioxide concentration have very little effect on the rate of photosynthesis at low light intensities. So only if it's a warm sunny day or there's a high light intensity does the changing of temperature and carbon dioxide actually have much of an effect on the rate. You can see from these graphs that increasing the temperature by 10 degrees and increasing the carbon dioxide concentration has an effect by increasing the rate of reaction but only when light is not limiting. From this graph, where we actually have all three factors plotted together, light intensity, two temperatures, and two different carbon dioxide concentrations, carbon dioxide concentration actually has the greater effect on the rate than the temperature, because you can see here that the 0.03% carbon dioxide lines are much lower than the 0.3% carbon dioxide concentration lines and the gap between the 15 and 25 degrees is actually a lot smaller. If optimum conditions are maintained then photosynthesis will happen at a faster rate increasing the yield. A greenhouse can be used to control these conditions and optimise them.
Light intensity is increased with glass windows and extra lighting for cloudy days and in the winter. Red and blue LEDs could also be used as these wavelengths increase the rate of photosynthesis. The temperature is controlled with automatic windows, fans and heaters that maintain an optimum temperature throughout the year. Carbon dioxide concentration in the air in the greenhouse can be pumped in from burners or engines or nearby factories. So anything that is burning fossil fuels will be producing carbon dioxide that can then be fed into a greenhouse or from growing fungi which will release carbon dioxide when they respire. It can also be controlled with automatic windows using carbon dioxide sensors. Although not direct factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis, plants need enough water and mineral ions and need them to be kept at an optimum so that they are not stressed. Any growers using greenhouses like this must balance the cost of having all of these extra features, so the carbon dioxide, the heaters or anything electrical being used to control temperature, and the ability to kind of automatically open the windows and all of this is gonna cost money. So we need to make sure that they're gonna get enough yield out of their plants to offset this cost and make a profit. Respiration is not breathing. It's an exothermic chemical reaction that occurs inside every cell to release energy from sugars. Aerobic respiration happens in the mitochondria in every cell. It uses oxygen to break down glucose and release energy. The symbol equation is O2 plus C6H12O6, and then it produces carbon dioxide and water. We need to know the uses of the energy released from respiration in organisms. It is needed to carry out chemical reactions to build new molecules like proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. It's needed for active transport to move substances against their concentration gradient. It's needed for movement, specifically muscle contraction, and also for keeping warm or maintaining certain body temperature. A reminder that any cell that carries out a lot of these processes, so active transport, muscle contraction in muscle cells, or building new molecules, they will have lots of mitochondria as an adaptation to make sure they can carry out more respiration to release more energy for these processes. Anaerobic respiration in animal cells takes place when there's little or no oxygen. It still breaks down glucose to release energy, but a smaller amount of energy is released. It happens in the cytoplasm of cells. So I've put in a box all of the facts we need to know about aerobic so we can start to compare it to anaerobic. So it happens in a different place. Anaerobic does not require oxygen. The products are different and the amount of energy released is different. In anaerobic respiration, glucose does not break down completely, but breaks down into lactic acid. Lactic acid is toxic if it builds up in cells, so it's removed by the blood to the liver. Anaerobic respiration usually occurs in muscle cells, during high intensity exercise when there isn't enough oxygen getting to them. Anaerobic respiration in plant and yeast cells is slightly different. Although in both cells, it still occurs in the cytoplasm. Don't forget that in plant cells, they also have mitochondria, so they can also carry out aerobic respiration as well. It still breaks down glucose to release a small amount of energy, but the products are different to anaerobic respiration in animal cells, and we call this process fermentation. Glucose breaks down to form carbon dioxide and ethanol. We need to learn about yeast and its anaerobic respiration because it's used in the food industry. The products of carbon dioxide from the fermentation reaction is used to make bread rice, and the product of the ethanol or the alcohol is used in the making of alcoholic drinks such as beer and wine. We need to be able to explain the body's response to exercise. During exercise, the body needs more energy from respiration. 
This is to help muscles contract. During exercise, the breathing rate and the volume of breathing increase in order to increase the concentration of oxygen in the blood. The heart rate also increases in order to pump more blood faster to muscle cells to deliver more oxygen and glucose. When talking about this, we need to use the word more a lot because your body always breathes and your heart always beats and you are always transporting oxygen and glucose around the body and your body does always need some energy. But when we are doing exercise, we need more energy because we're doing more muscle contraction so we need to increase our breathing rate to have more oxygen and we need to increase our heart rate to transport more blood faster to the cells so they can have more oxygen and glucose in order to carry out more respiration. In muscle cells as well, we have a store of glycogen, which is broken down to release the glucose for respiration. If you have prolonged high intensity exercise, not enough oxygen can reach muscle cells eventually. An anaerobic respiration occurs in them and starts to produce lactic acid. The glycogen is also used up in muscle cells and they become fatigued and stop contracting properly. The lactic acid produced by anaerobic respiration in the muscle cells travels in the blood to the liver. The buildup of lactic acid causes an oxygen debt. The oxygen debt is the amount of oxygen needed to react with the lactic acid to remove it from cells. In the liver, the lactic acid is converted back to glucose. Needing more oxygen after intense exercise to clear the oxygen debt is why we breathe heavily after exercise, even when we've stopped. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body. These are all controlled by enzymes and they require energy from respiration. Respiration itself is also a metabolic reaction. Photosynthesis is a metabolic reaction and it produces glucose. Glucose molecules can then be built together to make either glycogen, starch or cellulose. Glucose can also then be combined with nitrate ions that plants get from the soil to build amino acids. Amino acids can be joined together to form proteins in protein synthesis. Excess proteins in the body can be converted to urea for excretion in the liver. Glycerol and fatty acids can also be added together to build lipids. All of these are examples of metabolic reactions because they synthesize new molecules or break molecules down. I've highlighted in green photosynthesis, the conversion of glucose to cellulose, starch, or the combining of the glucose with the nitrate ions to make amino acids. All of these processes only happen in plants. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches.